Do you want to know what the latest installment of Elizabeth George's Inspector Lindley series is about? In this interview, get a preview of George's newest suspense novel, Something to Hide. Hi, it's Kathy from HEC Books, where we go straight to the authors to find out about their latest books. Make sure to click on the subscribe button if you're new, and make sure to watch to the end to hear George read an excerpt from Something to Hide. Elizabeth George, it is so great to have you here today to talk about Something to Hide. Thank you. Great to be here. So this is your latest installment in the Inspector Lindley series. Uh, tell us a little bit about this latest book of yours. This is a book that deals with a so social and cultural problem in uh, not only in the UK, but in other countries as well in the world. And it was something I wanted to explore through my writing for a number of years and finally saw an, the opportunity through the story that I was uh, intent upon developing. The, the background of the story, uh, sort of what I would call the underpinnings of the story is female genital mutilation. And um, this is something that has been practiced throughout the world for, for eons in, in different social groups. I was particularly interested in the way they are dealing with it in the United Kingdom and specifically in London, because I knew that they had been trying to deal with it right at the airport when somebody was leaving, like a woman and a, and a young girl would be leaving, but that was not, near, not as successful as they hoped it would be. And so they began to realize that they were going to have to work within the community to change the hearts and minds and uh, the social acceptance of this particular form of uh, f feminine abuse. That's where I began. That I and then the question was, okay, so if that's what I'm going to do, who's going to die? And if I'm going to have someone die, how do I get my Scotland Yard detectives involved in the uh, investigation? And uh, I was um, I was able to interview a a police team whose job is to deal with abuse of, the abuse of women. And when I spoke to them, I began to see uh, how, you know, how this crime could, I mean, who, who could be killed and how and why, um, as, as they explained to me what it was that they were, that they were doing. You sustain these two characters, Thomas Lindley and Barbara Havers, over many books, and it's it's really character driven mystery. Uh, how do you how, how do you know them so well, and do they just are they just familiar to you at this point? They are super familiar at this point since I have been um, writing about these characters since 1983. So I, I do know them fairly well. So do I know the kinds of things that Lindley would say and do. And the same thing with Barbara Havers. I mean, the two characters could not possibly be more different from each other, but they are you know thrust into this working situation as partners and in that situation, they've certainly grown and developed. And what I set out to do in these novels uh, is to show that a man and a woman could, uh, could not only work together, but come to love each other, but the love it would be in no way sexual. So anybody who reads the books would know that there's no way that uh, Thomas Lindley and Barbara Havers would ever have a romantic relationship or end up in bed together. They, I mean, it's, it's sort of absurd if you know the characters and, and I know the characters. And so I know that they wouldn't do that. I do have a lot of fun with these two characters because Barbara Havers pretty much will say anything and do anything. And so she's given me a lot of laughs over the years. Well, I, I've seen some of your fans, you know, who say, that they really love her as a character. I think they feel like she's a friend, like they could just hang out with her or something. You know, she's yeah. she's just so approachable. And there's also a clash, if you will, of classes between the two of them, which can add to some tension and make it really interesting. Sure. And that was another thing that I wanted to look at is the, you know, the, the yeah. British people um, tend to deny that there is a class system uh, any longer in their country. And I mean, it, 
which is sort of amusing. It still exists. It's just that uh, now it's more hidden than it was before. It's more like a, an at, at a, attitudinal kind of class system. It has a lot to do with, uh, well, I mean, it has a lot to do with the, uh, the age of one's money and the fa- whether you have money or not. But the big thing is, uh, the, you know, what strata of society, stratum of society a person is born into and how that mm-hmm. particular stratum defines who they are. You know, one of the interesting things to me in uh, when I look at Great Britain is the fact that, um, you know, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge's family, the Middletons, two generations back, they were coal miners. And so, you know, when Prince Charles got married, he had to find somebody who was, first of all, you know, a virgin. And secondly, a virgin who was of a certain background, who was also willing to marry, (laughs) marry him. And here is... Prince William marrying his college sweetheart many, many years later, but you know, she, she was always his girlfriend and, and was from this middle-class family. Uh, that was unheard of when Prince Charles, his own father, had to find a wife. That's really interesting you say that because you've probably seen a lot of changes through the years just in British society and, you know, and how people are divided or not divided. And, and now this most recent book, Something to Hide, involves an immigrant community, which I don't think they're probably quite up to a lot of other people in terms of class because they're so new. Mm. And you could see that in some of the locations, you know, there were very distinct locations that you chose for for scenes. And it depended on who the character was. There were very upper class locations and then more of the areas where an immigrant family might live. Uh, Yeah. And, And that's, you know, all you have to do is actually go to one of these specific areas and then you see the way in which the area still is um, uh, defined by let's, by working class and an area that is being gentrified. There are you know vast swaths of London that are no longer uh, affordable to the working class people who once lived there because the London spread keeps spreading out and as it spreads out it becomes more and more gentrified and they put up you know they put up big fancy apartment buildings and uh, and big fancy hotels and things that the members of the immigrant community, can't, you know, certainly can't afford to be part of. But at the same time, what's really interesting is that there's a lot there that is the same. So, for example, where the immigrant community in in the book lives near Ridley Road, um, that particular area has gone through a number of different changes over the years. I talked to a man who was in Ridley Road Market who had a stall there. I asked him how long he'd been tra- trading, as the British say, trading there. And he had been there for 50 years. And so he was able to tell me over the years who the uh, who the people were who lived in that particular neighborhood and how it had changed and how it had changed back to uh, you know it's real it's fascinating to see uh, how London continually kind of redefines itself. Thanks for joining us, and if you liked this video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for new content. To find out how Elizabeth George researches subjects for her novels, look for part two of her interview. Tani Mola Bancole had been clinging to the hope that a fourth straight week of misery-inducing summer heat would disrupt his father's train of thought, which had been steaming along the railway track of Tani's irresponsibility for the last 37 minutes. This wasn't a new subject for Abeo Bancole. Tani's father was fully capable of banging on both in English and in his native Yoruba for 45 minutes, and he'd done just that on more than one occasion. He saw it as his parental obligation to make certain Tani fully took up the mantle of manhood, as defined by Abeo. And Tani could do this only by embracing all of manhood's attendant duties, also as defined by Abeo. At the same time, he saw it as Tani's filial obligation to listen to, to remember, 
and to obey his father in all things. The first of the three, Tani generally managed. It was the second and third that caused him trouble. On this particular day, Tani couldn't argue against a single point his father was making. He was lucky to have regular work made available to him by virtue of being the son of Abeo Bancole, proprietor of Into Africa Groceries, etc., as well as a butcher shop and a fishmonger's stall. He was privileged that his father allowed him to keep one-eighth of his wages for his personal use instead of depositing all of them into the family pot. He did enjoy three meals each day provided for him by his mother. His laundry was delivered to his bedroom spotlessly clean and perfectly ironed, etc., etc., and blah, blah, blah. Instead of taking any kind of notice of the waves of heat rising from the pavement of the trees, where there were any in this part of town, losing their leaves far too early into the year, of the remaining ice in the fish stalls and Ridbury Road market melting so quickly that the air was thick with the smell of hate and snapper and mackerel, of the meat in the butcher's stalls sending forth a stench of blood from the simmering organs of sheep and cows, of the fruit and veg having to be sold at discount before they rotted, Abeo merely strode onward in the direction of Mayville Estate, oblivious of everything save Tani's failure to arrive at work on time.